almost feel like we should have played like a, an intro for that a little bit to, to get things started. But a right. uh, great discussion. Um, we have a lot of connections, actually. I mean, all of us uh, being here from California uh, or have lived here at one point, uh, Tammy, you and I have been on a, uh, a seminar similar to this once before as well, too. So uh, some really good insights. Um, and want to introduce everybody to, uh, to the two great speakers that we have, uh, Dr. Tammy McCoy Arbola and Dr. Theopia, excuse me, I apologize, nice. Dr. Theopia nice. Jackson. Uh, some, uh, some really good insights here. I'm going to give you a, a rundown of, uh, of who they are. Um, Dr. Tammy McCoy Arbalo is a licensed clinical forensic psychologist right here in California who teaches and treats emergency responders impacted by trauma, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, and suicide prevention. Now, prior to becoming a psychologist, uh, the native New Yorker uh, has a sense of what we go through every day because she was a journalist who covered the criminal justice beat for 11 years. Uh, in 2018, she provided services over several days to sworn and civilian employees involved in the government response to the campfire. She's seen some, some really traumatic instances uh, throughout her career. Um, the largest fire in California history. Um, and also Dr. McCoy Arbala responded to numerous mass shootings, including the Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting back in 2019, uh, the 2018 Pathway Home shooting in Yountville, and the Route 91 Harvest Festival attack. And we all know that happened in Las Vegas back in 2017. And then in December, two, December 2015, um, the uh, terrorist attack in San Bernardino County. Now beyond treatment, Dr. McCoy Arbala is a hostage negotiator with the emergency negotiations teams for the Riverside Police Department and the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. And she is married to a retired journalist and they have two cats named Woodward <laughs> and Bernstein. Right. How fitting. <laughs> Welcome and thank you so very much for your time. Um, and now for uh, Dr. Theopia Jackson. Uh, she's a licensed clinical psychologist who received her master's degree in a clinical psychology uh, from Howard University in Washington, D.C. That's the other HU. Um, no, <laughs> we can discuss that later. <laughs> yeah, I, w I went to Hampton, so we'll be... I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Jackson is a 2019-2021 president for the Association of Black Psychologists Incorporated and past president for the Bay Area chapter. She has held several leadership roles in higher education and is currently the co-chair of the Department of Humanis Humanistic and Clinical Psychology and chair of the clinical psychology degree program at Saybrook University in Pasadena, California. Gosh. She recently relocated to Maryland after 30 plus years. I don't know why you wanted to leave the West Coast. Uh, <laughs> after practicing in the Bay Area where she held medical privileges at UCSF, Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. She practiced in the Healthy Hearts Program, Department of Psychiatry and Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center. Her other professional affiliations include membership in the Association of Family Therapists of Northern California, American Psychological Association, and California Psychological Association. And she's a member of DST, Delta Sigma Theta. Uh, she serves on the Medical Advisory Council, the Sickle Cell Community Advisory Council. Dr. Jackson has a long history of providing children, adolescent, and family therapy services, specializing in serving populations coping with chronic illness, and complex trauma. She's an accomplished scholar, practitioner, and educator who provides Not multicultural uh, equity workshops and seminars and or consultation. Um, and she's got a, a model that she kind of lives by um, that she espouses. What you help a child to love can be more important than what you help them to learn. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Theopia Jackson. So again, thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Um, as journalists, uh, our job's already very stressful, but 2020, uh, something really special. Um, I don't know if you guys kind of, everybody thinks about the pandemic, but um, I think a lot of the trauma that we've experienced this year kind of started for some people, especially here in the uh, California area, Kobe Bryant, his death, um, that kind of kicked off everything. Um, massive um, um, ceremonies for him. Then we had the uh, pandemic, uh, we had George Floyd, uh, we had the uh, Central Park issue that happened, those two issues together. Um, and now our industry challenged with uh, job losses. So it's, it's one of those things where it kind of makes you think of another song. You know, you sit and you're thinking, Marvin, what's going on? What is going on? Um, but as journalists, you know, we're dealing with all these things and uh, trying, to, trying to cope. We're, we're soaking all this in. We're sponges, uh, but we're expected to be out there on the forefront of television, newspaper, uh, putting on a good face, um, having an ironclad um, shell 
And that's kind of one of the reasons why we came up with this, this uh, title of taking off the mask, journalists and mental health, the conversation. Um, I mean, it feels like it's so appropriate for this day and time. We're talking about a mask and we've been wearing masks for us for a couple of weeks now or a couple of months, I should say, actually. Um, so it's almost fitting that, it, that this, um, this is uh, kind of named after that, entitled after that. But um, wearing the mask is kind of a metaphor for something that all of us have done at times in our life in terms of coping mechanisms and, and conforming. And so that's where we want to start the conversation is, um, you know, explaining what the title is and how the mask that we wear helps us to cope and helps us to conform. Um, and want to start with uh, Dr. Arbalo, if we could, um, because you're a journalist, um, you kind of speak our language to a degree. Um, you can help simplify this, and then I'm going to let you, uh, Dr. Theopia, <laughs> um, you can, can pick up because we're, you're going to take us back to a psychology class in college. So uh, <laughs> if, you, if you could, uh, Tammy, uh, talk to us a little bit about the mask and, and what that means. Sure. And before I do that, I think it's really important that we say thank you mm -hmm. to all the men and women working in journalism today, to the journalism students who are learning to be our journalists of tomorrow. So there has never been a more important time to do this job well. And, and we are relying on you, those who are no longer in the news business. We need you to help us navigate everything that's going on. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Um, the reason we even started having these conversations was because I started seeing a need with my friends who are reporters who are struggling. Um, and my goal here today is, is to help in any way possible because you are my family, you are my people. Um, wearing masks really, to me, is about, we go into a newsroom, we go into a place of employment where the expectation is you gotta be a badass all the time. You can't flinch, you can't show your true self. You've gotta have that suit of armor on. And in wearing that suit, in, in protect, projecting ourselves in that way, we don't get to be our true authentic self. We are looking around the room for cues. How are other people responding? How are they behaving? And we're mimicking, we're doing what we think they think is gonna be okay. So our bosses don't devalue us. So our friends don't think less of us. So that our competition in these rooms are filled with competitive alpha people. They don't get a jump on us. It is really hard to feel safe in a lot of newsrooms. Um, having worked in several of them, I've worked in newsrooms where I could say whatever I thought, and I had other newsrooms where I didn't dare say what I thought because of the climate and the culture and the competition. And you know, a lot of newsrooms are not safe places. They're not easy places to be in under the best of circumstances. You add the, the insanity that is 2020 to it, and you're looking around wearing that suit of armor because you need to survive. You want to keep your job. You want to be respected. You want to get the great assignments. But that robs us of our authenticity. It robs us of a feeling like our true selves are good enough. And it creates a whole myriad of complications. When we wear the socially appropriate mask, we're not showing the world who we are. And the subconscious message we send ourselves is to say, I'm not good enough. And that is damaging on so many levels. Um, and then we, we operate in different, you know, after we get out of the newsroom and we're out in public, as journalists, we have to wear a different kind of mask. And that mask makes engaging authentically really difficult too. And so we're stifling and we're stymieing and we're pushing ourselves down, right? And we're desperate to find a place where we can let the physical mask, the emotional mask, the mental mask and take it off. And at a time and a place where we're social distancing and we're not able to be around people and we're afraid of if we really do let our guard down how are my friends, my families of different perspectives going to respond to my being my authentic self? Um, the politics that have taken over since 2016 and the culture wars have made it very difficult for a lot of families to come together and, and be authentic with each other. It's been very, very divisive. And, and it's been kind of that perfect storm of people feeling isolated because that mask has to be on in virtually every domain of our lives. And that creates its own level of stress and trauma. And uh, Dr. Jackson, uh, you come at the mask from a slightly different perspective uh, from our talk a little bit earlier. Talk to us about what you see in the mask and how we deal with it. 
Okay, beautiful. Thank you. First and foremost, I have to say Hotep family and appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to be part of your village, to welcome me into your house. And I'm looking forward to this conversation today, but I want to put a little bit of context for what I'm hoping to bring. So the Association of Black Psychologists was started in 1968, which is probably similar around the same time that this organization was started. When most black organizations were born from the civil rights movement in terms of advocating for the right to be at the table. However, a unique charge for the Association of Black Psychology has been in fact to dedicate itself to trying to understand not only what it means to be black in America in terms of what we're dealing with and contending with, but more specifically to be intentional about reclaiming our cultural science, our cultural wisdom and traditions that were always there for us before we came to these shores in 1619 that many of us would submit are still living in our DNA. An example I offer around that is the theory around vibe, that we're always vibing. So everything we touch, we change the rhythm of it. You know, basketball looks the way it does because of the vibe we brought there, tennis, every other sport, every other way of being. So what I'm hoping to bring to today's conversation, because I want to make sure you're hearing us clearly, is I so appreciate all that Tammy is bringing because I too have been trained through the American Psychological Association, trained in a similar way so she has knowledge here. However, as a black psychologist, we've been trying to take this at a deeper dive, a deeper felt level. And so, as, and, I'm, and I'm hoping to complement what she's bringing, and here's a good example of that around the conceptualization of the mask. What, what, what I would submit to you is that people of African ancestry and people of color or others from targeted groups, but today we're gonna to focus on black folks have always had to wear some type of a mask. We figuratively wore real mask during a period of enslavement. If somehow our beauty threatened somebody's presence, then we, were, then we would put a muzzle was placed on us. But then as we are trying to understand the, to our own survival, we had to find a way to be around other folk. And since that period of time, we're still doing that. We wear the mask in lots of different ways. You know, Kenneth Hardy talks about the imposter syndrome, meaning that after civil rights movement, many times black folks are put in a position to think that they got to the table because of civil rights and not because they actually earned it and that they are worthy of it. Or more specifically, their counterparts sometimes think that. And they've been known to make that known and very clear that you're here because of affirmative action and not because of your actual capacity to be here. So there's ways in which you're having to wear a mask around that to kind of still sit and be part of and, 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 and to do your part. So you're, you're, the, the way that Tammy talked about the mask is phenomenal. And yet I would submit that many black folks do not have a chance to take off the mask in other parts of their lives. So then the question becomes, what does it mean to be wearing a mask in so many different spaces and places? I, I, I'll also say too, other examples of this is, in addition to what she shared, I would submit not having, I'm not a journalist, but everything that you've talked about feels completely familiar to me as a black psychologist and with every other professional black that I know and within their systems of, of how they've had to show up in, in, a, in a false sense of self in order to fit. But, but the other challenge for us is that sometimes we have to make someone else comfortable with our blackness. And this shows up around the idea of when a black woman says something, she's accused of being aggressive. But when her white counterpart says it, she's, she's um, applauded for being assertive. Or the myth around the angry black woman, or even the myth around John Henryism. I can think of a story here where um, in my, we had a black male social worker in our sickle cell program. And having a black male social worker is just jewels. But yet he was written up because the nurses were uncomfortable because he did not smile. So there's something about that psychology of the mask. And then now that we're wearing the physical mask around one another, it further distances us. And I would submit it can activate fear in others because up until the time of COVID, a mask meant that you were up to no good. So to be wearing a mask and be of dark skin will still activate that fear before somebody reminds himself, oh, that's right, we're in the midst of COVID, particularly in a country that is in various places in response to 
wearing a mask or not wearing it. So I just wanted to offer that as another way of thinking about the complexities of the mask for journalists in general and definitely for journalists in black and brown skin. And yeah, I was going to actually, I was actually going to, to ask about um, to brown skin as well too. And also, I guess, women as well too. I mean, there's, I mean, when you're in these situations, I mean, you talk about African-Americans, but there's also um, women who have to wear a mask uh, inside a newsroom or uh, in society. Uh, brown people do as well too. Um, Tammy, you kind of uh, hinted at that, I think, or just in general talking about the fact that newsrooms um, aren't always the best climate culture um, and they can be extremely complicated. Um, what happens when you have to deal with those types of situations and have to wear those masks on a consistent basis? The multitude of problems that that creates, um, depression, anxiety, um, feelings of inadequacy, and, and not just, I think Dr. Jackson pointed out, imposter syndrome. Um, when you are surrounded, in most of the newsrooms I worked in, I'm gonna talk from my own personal experience, um, they were white men. Um, my husband was the only Latino in the newsroom that I'd ever seen in my life. That was how well dom male, male white dominated the newsrooms were. And can, a, lot of, a lot of them continue to be. Um, and as a white woman working in a, in a newsroom with white men, um, there was always concern about you know, gender inequity. Um, so that can create a multitude of challenges. Compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, secondary traumatic stress, substance abuse, eating disorders. Um, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to share with you an experience um, of just covering the beat and how all of that mask wearing can really affect somebody. Uh, in 2005, 2006, I had a stream of weeks where I covered nothing but sexual assault trials, three of them, back to back to back. And when you're in courts covering things live, um, you don't get a chance to go back to your newsroom and hang out with your friends and BS and decompress. You are totally ensconced in this world of the story of the case. And you're hearing children and women talk about being brutalized and violated and almost killed. And, and you've got defendants who are giving their defense and saying, well, you know, it wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. Or, you know, this eight year old asked to be touched in a way that was inappropriate. And a steady diet of that of course, when you have to be a badass reporter, um, you can't go back to the newsroom and, and say to your boss, wow, this is ho wholly devastating and just disgusting and I'm feeling horrible. You've just gotta keep filing three and four stories where all you're doing is repeating the graphic details and the horror and it's, it's constantly on you. And you kind of get this film on you of all of that bucky. And so a few weeks are going by and I'm, I'm going to the third trial and I'm coming home from work and I'm not talking about it. Because, you know, yeah, I'll talk about my day, but I don't want to talk about the graphic nature of it because I don't want to bring that up at dinner. And I don't want my, my boyfriend, now husband at the time, to talk about it either because I want to forget it. I want to act like it's not there. I want to push it away. Um, at some point, um, I was having a difficult time with intimacy because I would see flashes of the case of those horror stories. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the flashes that bothered me. It was my own reaction of, oh my God, what's wrong with me? I must be defective. There must be something profoundly wrong with me that I'm having these flashes. I must be defective. And so a couple of days go on, I go back to work and I said to my editor, you know, can we like cover something else for a little bit? I, I just, I have some other fluff stories that I'd rather cover. And, and I work for this fantastic editor named Marco Costa. Um, who said, yeah, sure, as, as long as you, you know, file a couple of stories, you want to do something fun and different, I'm totally open to that. I wasn't able to tell Mark, yeah, I'm really struggling. I've, I've had too much of this because I was afraid of what he would think of me. He used to call me his bulldog. Um, that was my nickname in the newsroom. And I did not want to lose that cherished nickname. I didn't want to lose face. I didn't want him to think less of me. I didn't also want my newsroom colleagues to think I wasn't up to the challenge. Taking off that mask wasn't an option, right? but I'm sitting there struggling inside, terrified that there is something really scary. So I got a really bad cold. The day after I told Mark I was gonna take some, some changes in direction, I got this horrible cold and I slept for about two days. It was my immune system reacting to everything that was happening. What's happening up here affects the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. And when we're stressed and we're overwhelmed, that has a physical cost to us. So 
I had two days off where I was sleeping really, really well, drinking a lot of fluids, um, wasn't thinking about work, was just focusing on getting better. And as that cold got better, I finally found the strength in me to say to my husband, you know, this case really kind of messed with my head. And I, I do think it's time to, to have a little bit of a conversation. Again, I was really lucky. I'm married to the nicest man on the planet. Um, and he knows what I do for a living because he's done it too. So it was a really easy conversation on his end and he was supportive and validating and understanding, um, which is why I married him. Um, but it was so embarrassing for me to have to say to him, this is what's happening. And I feel so horrible about myself because no one teaches you in, in journalism school. No one talks about this in newsrooms. No one says, hey, it wasn't until a decade later when I was in graduate school learning how to be a psychologist that I understood that this was a normal and appropriate reaction to bearing witness, being in rooms with people suffering the worst of human experiences, <laughs> among the worst of human experiences. Um, and, and it was only then that I could put that in perspective because I'd been carrying around this piece of me thinking, I'm weak, I'm stupid, I'm not as good as I thought I was. Um, and maybe if somebody else were doing my job, they wouldn't have this. Because we don't talk about it, we don't train journalists right. in, in this basic fundamental of mental health. Because the act of witnessing as a journalist what's going on, the suffering of others, comes at a cost to us. Because we don't just sit there and observe and go, oh wow. We say things like, well, this isn't my problem, this isn't my trauma. But we get so up close and personal we get into the nitty gritty details and we write them down and then we talk about them and then we publish them and then we talk about them some more. It is on us. It is not just their trauma. It can become our trauma. Um, we talk about compassion fatigue, which, which causes emotional and physical exhaustion and can lead to a lack of empathy and caring for other people, right? It can just drain us when we're not refueling, when we're not taking care of ourselves. It can rob us of that piece of our humanity because we've given and we've given and we've seen so much that it, we end up so depleted. Can I, um, can I interrupt real quick? I'm sorry. It was um, a lot of what you said are some of the things that, uh, that I've been through as a journalist also. I remember um, back in the day having to deal with, um, you know, a steady diet of shooting, stabbing, um, yeah. death, death, death. Yeah. And I was just like you um, saying, please just give me a happy story. Um, I don't remember Jeopardy came to town and I was like, please, can I just do, can I do the Jeopardy story? Um, and fortunately, I was able to do that. I'm going to come to you, uh, Dr. Jackson, in a second, but is it, um, back to you, Dr. Abayo, is it, is it different from a woman's perspective? Because uh, I, I heard you mention the fact that um, you want to be the pit bull, you want to feel strong. I never sensed it as being weak. Um, if I were to say no, or if I didn't want to cover it, um, I just knew that I was drained and I couldn't do it. Is there something that's different in men and women when it comes to covering stories and not wanting to say, hey, I can't do that today? I think when, when you are working the cops and courts beat and, and Dana Littlefield, who does a phenomenal yeah. job at the, at the San Diego UT, um, we have to project this image of, we can handle it because it's such a male dominated field and it's competitive. And people, in my experience, always wanted my beat. And I had other reporters from other bureaus who would put in to take over my position if I ever decided to leave. So I knew in the environments I worked in that there were sharks waiting to bounce um, when I started to either take vacation people, there were eight people who signed up at one of my workplace employments to cover my beat while I was on vacation. Eight people, you know. So I knew that it was a coveted position, that it was high profile, that my boss thought highly of me. And I wanted to be thought highly of. I wanted to be seen as, as a real contender. And I don't know if that's a male thing or if that's a Tammy thing or if, if that's a multitude of things. Um, I think we're all different. I think it's harder for women um, to not get this, this stereotype of being hysterical or being overly sensitive. We get invalidated a lot when we express, hey, this really upsets me. And it's like, oh, she's being an emotional chick. Um, and I never wanted to be that because I wanted to be perceived as who I thought I was, which is strong and capable. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Jackson, uh, kind of to that point, but I want to steer in a slightly different direction. Um, talking about the, the trauma and the stress that we consistently deal with as journalists, uh, like 
Dr. Abayo was saying that uh, she was just, you know, fatigued after covering all the, all the murders and all the, uh, the sexual assaults. Uh, myself, I've been through that same thing as well. Um, and then you add on top of that what happened back in May with uh, George Floyd. Um, and that's just one stress, a stressor, a trigger that really kind of sent people off the deep end. But you had mentioned the fact that um, people of color, color live in a perpetual state of trauma. Can you um, explain that? Right. Thank you. And let me back up a little bit too to also expand to your question about the experiences of women. First and foremost, the storiness that my colleague just told is a familiar one, again, in every industry. You can just take out the word <laughs> journalist and put in law enforcement, put in psychologist, put in judge, because these are real traumas that we're all being exposed to. And we are all, and, and, and Tammy, you said you wasn't sure if this was a women's or Tammy. I would say it's called the American way, which is part of the challenge is that we're, we're built on this institutional um, ideology of you know the the individual the bravest the strongest the best and, and that peripherates throughout everything that we do so when I think about the experiences of women I might invite us on the call to follow what Kimberly Crenshaw and others have talked about which is looking at the issues of intersectionality to, to try to resist the temptation of a either or because it can begin to look like we're trying to um, compete for whose pain is the worst pain and when, when the situation itself is funky. Instead, the idea of, inter, <clears throat> excuse me, idea of intersectionality will say that when you put a certain macrame of identities together, one can be exposed to um, discrimination, disenfranchisement, um, have um, devalued based on any one of those contexts. So for example, there's the black and brown women. So are they being, um, disenfranchised because of being black or because they're women, or it could be the interplay of both is what I'm trying to say. So we, so we want to be able to look at how all those complexities show, because even for Tammy, she could be disenfranchised because she's a woman or because of ageism, right? Because, because this country does not value you over a certain age as well. So that's, that's the one gift I want to give to the conversation is to think more critically about the different types of ways that we can disenfranchise or be discriminated against and resist the temptation, as I said before, of either or. The way it comes into this conversation now around your question around Brother Floyd, what for me, I would say that people of African ancestry have been living with seen and unseen pandemics since the beginning of time, since we first met certain people. Here in the United States, it would be 1619 when the first Africans were trafficked here and brought here. What this means, though, is that we've been trying to define our own humanity, be seen as human in these various contexts, so that when the COVID hit, first and foremost, many of us did not need to go, well, let's wait and see what stats show if there's going to be a difference about how the COVID hits certain um, communities. Those of us doing this work, may it be from the Black Psychiatrists Association or the National Association of Black Social Workers or Black Nurses, all of us, we knew from the get-go that our community is going to be hit the worst. And we began to activate ourselves to provide services before the rest of, um, be before our journalists caught up with us. I'll say it that way. And you caught up with us once the scientists started putting out the information. But, but when, when Floyd hit, I would submit, if we think about history, in the United States is this, this idea of our history that says the shot that was heard around the world, Floyd was the murder that was felt around the world. Because what the COVID did was when it sat us all down and brought us into the shelter in place and stay still, it pulled back the curtain on the longstanding complex history of racism in this country when Floyd, when those 8.46 seconds happened this activated trauma around the world, not just for humans in general, but definitely those of African ancestry, because the trauma that Tammy talked about is what we call secondary or type two. She wasn't the direct respondent of, of the story, but witnessing someone else's story activated that sense of trauma and pain in her that she had to deal with for care. That too gets activated every single time a black body, a brown body is killed in front of us in such a merciless way. 
it, it resurrects the DNA in us of all the multiple times in which black bodies and brown bodies have been taken senselessly. So Floyd, so, so Brother Floyd's death activated that in us as well as pain in our non-black colleagues because for some folks it woke them up in a sense of they were in what I would call a racial slumber where they really did think everything was okay. Remember somebody around here called us post-racial. I know it wasn't anybody in my circle but someone began to tell the story that America was post-racial with, the, with, the, with President Obama but yet Floyd's death clearly unequivocally showed that we are not post-racial, that this issue of race has not been resolved in the United States. So that's what I would say here. And, and so it activates not only all the symptoms that Tammy just talked about in terms of depression, self-doubt, worry, fear. I mean, black mamas have been worried about their children leaving and being able to come back home for years. No one really heard that or appreciated that. That's why every time this happens, we grieve deeply because it is personal. So I think about my colleagues in the journal as the ones who are covering that story. And let me say too, for all that you just described, Tammy, I'm the therapist treating those children, right? So, so that's what I'm trying, so, so this, 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 this macrame of pain is real. So I would imagine just like for me, if you're a journalist covering the story over and over again, and you are bearing witness not only to that death, but to the realization that there are some contributing factors around systemic oppression, systemic racism, there by the grace of God, go you. I mean, I see two beautiful black brothers here, Terry and Omari, but you know what, you could, you, you could have been Floyd. Your degree and your social economic status and your humanity did not differentiate you from the potential of being Brother Omar. The, the fact that you can't jog and, and someone can't realize that you're jogging, you have the right to jog. And instead they're seeing their own image of who they thought that person was, that you are stealing and therefore I have the right to shoot you. That's a real fear that each and every one of you are carrying either knowingly or unknowingly. And I'll, because what, I, what I mean by that is when I think about health, when we are consciously aware that someone can prejudge us based on the color of our skin, when I'm aware of that, it doesn't mean I walk around paranoid. It means I walk around making intentional decisions. Did I just get dismissed in that line because the person really did have a bad day? Did they overlook me? Did I do, or is it really because of the color of my skin? It's part of my survival. It also lets me know I'm not losing my mind if I do a review and I find out, yep, that was another one of those microaggressions that's something to do with me being black. That helps me to understand when I'm in safe company and when I'm not. So this is what Brother Floyd's death has activated is this intention now that we're in a critical part of our history, that we are not going backwards. The civil rights movement prepared us for this moment. This moment would catalyst us into the future. This is an opportunity for all to stand up and demand our own humanity, our own way of being. And when I think about the way you've described the culture of the industry for journalists, I would submit to you clearly, it doesn't work right for anyone, let alone black and brown. So as you advocate for change, you're advocating for all of humanity because there should be a way that, that Tammy can be just as accomplished in getting everything done and meeting the needs without having to be conceptualized as a bulldog. And that is what feminist thinking and feminist values do bring to the table. And those companies that are led by black, by women in general, but definitely black women, you can see a culture shift change where people are working in a more humane way, which means that they're healthier, they're, they're, they're more productive, there's less sick time off, and yet they're still getting the job done. So the way we've been doing it doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. I guess that uh, kind of leads into to one of the questions that I had, that uh, the, the media now getting its kind of day of reckoning, so to speak, uh, with George Floyd's uh, incident. Um, you've got a lot of people in the newsrooms that are, are writing to management, telling them there needs to be some type of structural change. Um, how do you keep your company's lack of diversity or gender inequality um, from making you feel disillusioned? Um, Tammy, I'll start off with uh, you, since uh, you had mentioned something to that effect a little bit earlier. 
You know, I, I think that one of the biggest challenges um, with my journalist clients um, and as well as, as watching everything that's going on here is making that separation of who I am versus the way I'm treated. Um, being able to assert ourselves and saying, I do not want to be in a place where I'm treated like this and having conversations and asserting yourself and not feeling like you're powerless or helpless to do anything. We are not powerless to do anything. We have seen journalists come together in newsrooms across the country and, and say to their, their, their buyers, their owners, and the LA Times has had some fantastic conversations saying, you know, we cannot keep going on like this. Um, and recognizing that you have power and control over one, how you let things affect you, but two, what you tolerate, right? If we do not feel safe in our newsrooms, if we do not feel like we're going to be treated with the respect and the dignity and the pay equity and, and all the other things we have every right to expect from, we also have opportunities to say, you know what, I'm not gonna be here. Um, and for a lot of us with the job insecurity that comes with journalism, we feel like we've been robbed of that because it's where am I gonna find a job in journalism? I'm just lucky to have this job now. Um, and that's where we start making choices and we start stepping back and saying, what can I tolerate? Um, I had rules about quitting uh, my job. If I ever got treated a certain way, I knew in my head I would quit and I would find something else because there are things that I just wouldn't tolerate. And I think we should all have that list in our head of, of non-negotiables. Um, but I also think when we start to feel really powerless and helpless and, and just lost in all this, we need to reach out to the people around us. Um, and in some newsrooms, that's easier than in others because of the dynamics of a, of a newsroom. Or if you're an executive producer, I think that talking to the people, join, having them join you in your foxhole, it's always better to have company in the foxhole as you figure out what you want to do, what you can do. Not feeling isolated and alone in all this, because if you're feeling it, dollars to donuts, somebody else is probably feeling it too. So reminding yourself that you're not alone, reaching out that what you're thinking, what you're feeling is completely valid just because you're thinking and feeling it. Um, job insecurity is a real thing. And we struggle with that idea of who will take me at a time and a place. And, and that's, that's something no one can tell you what to do with. It's, it's your choice. But I don't want people walking around feeling like they have no options. There's always an option. There's always a choice. We always have power to make, make good choices. Um, um, let me, let me, uh, let me, I'm sorry to cut you off right there. Um, so you bring up a good point. I mean, in, in journalism, um, it's kind of a, seems like there's a finite amount of opportunities to a degree. Um, in any one given city, there's only, you know, maybe three, four TV stations, um, newspaper industry, just like TV shrinking as well too. So not as many uh, publications out there as well too. So for you, you, you talk about, um, you had this, notion in your head of how you want to be treated and if uh, something happened, you knew that was my, my cue that I had to leave. Um, that's something that a lot of people struggle with um, in terms of they're like, this is the only thing I know how to do. This is uh, the only job I feel I can get. Right. Um, what do you say to those folks out there who are saying that, you know, this TV job, this newspaper job is the only journalism job I can get and I don't want to leave uh, the city uh, to go to another place. What do you say to those folks out there? Do not devalue yourself. Um, I know I had thoughts about that when I started off that this is the only thing I can do. Um, and then now I'm a psychologist. And if I can go to school and become a doctor and, and live in the same community, anything's possible for anyone. Please do not devalue yourself. There are always options. But sometimes it's hard to see that when you're frustrated and you're down on yourself. And that's why reaching out, um, having a mentor, talking to people in organizations like NABJ, or, or like-minded organizations where you can have a sense of community and you can one, network, but two, also hear the experiences of other people who have been through experiences, right? That reaching out is such a valuable thing. We're social animals, we need other people. And when we are feeling embattled and helpless and lost and scared, the most powerful thing we can do is reach out and say, okay, I need to get some support somewhere. Okay. Uh, Amari, I could add to that one too, because yeah, I, was, I, was I, to I want to applaud what you're already doing, which is the intentionality of talking across disciplines as well too. Because as I'm trying to convey being your guest here, much of what you're saying 
is a mirroring experience. I was blessed to be part of the National Organization for Black Law Enforcement um, program last week. Before that, these are similar stories. That's part of the challenge is, is, is if, you, if you stay within, if you, if you keep the conversation within the journalist realm only, then sometimes you might just be sort of preaching to the choir or spinning in collective misery, right? If we, are, if we can be so bold as to have conversations across disciplines, learning from one another, and also um, being able to leverage collective power and authority, particularly around the issues of capitalism, you may also be able to affect some of the changes that Tammy's speaking to. And I, and I want to applaud you, Amari, for begging the question a little bit further, because if, when I hear that story too, if you are the first of a generation, right, you, you have another layer of complexity on what choices you really do have. If, you are all, if you're already entering into the field and yet you're still living in poverty with your family, right? And, and you know this is real talk. Many of us. Oh talk yeah, I'm just yeah, I'm just I, I'm I, thinking I, I'm I'm minimalizing it to, yeah, to just I'll journalism. Be, but I'm thinking yeah. about those first jobs that a lot of yeah, us have. Absolutely. We go, we go to those I'm small cities. And, yeah, right. yeah. I'm I was, one of them. I was living I with my aunt and uncle. Yeah, I'm 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 the firstborn of a single parent. Grew up on welfare. I'm one I'm I, I'm one of Monahan's kids. I'm not supposed to sit here. So so. I just want to say yes to everything Tammy said and deeper that sometimes it's not, you don't have the luxury of making decisions solely for yourself that you want to make. And also to be clear, for some groups, there's a cultural way of being that your decisions belong to the community anyway and not to you as an individual, right? And that's a value thing, right? Many, many of our indigenous groups think of it that way. And we did as black folks too. That's how we survive. We survive. We make decisions. I would do what's best for my community, which is therefore what's best for me. And I would su submit that what got me here, when I look back over, really was different folks in my quote village who moved me through. Because sometimes we may need someone else to lift us up and believe in us before we can believe in ourselves and even recognize that we have options, that we have choices to make because we've been socialized in such a way that we've just been trying to react, just getting the job to keep the food on the table. I was going to ask you about going to your boss to try and figure out a way to uh, discuss certain issues in terms of making um, improving diversity efforts, but I want to uh, tackle something that you just said there that um, as people of color, we make decisions based on the community. Um, is that always the best way? And, and what you said, I totally agree with that you, you do have to have a village to help lift you up. Um, but in that, sometimes you're concerned about what the village is thinking and may not be doing everything that's best for you or that village uh, could be tearing you down a little bit because you may not be about that village life anymore. You may be about another life. Well, let me preface first by saying again, what Wade Nobles has said quite beautifully. So you took me back we, to school again. I, uh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> he's, still, he's still teaching too. Okay, okay. All right. That, you know, we are American by, by nurture and African by nature right? All of this is in here. Once again, it's not an either or. I can't submit enough how much I'm trying to bring forward a both and, and more specifically, understanding what it means to be human within context, what's in your surrounding, what's going on around you. Because when we think about the collective way of being, if it, it says the village, it takes a child to raise, it takes a village to raise a child, but that's assuming the village is healthy and functioning, right? It doesn't mean everything has to happen that way. I concur that, at, that sometimes it quote is in our best interest to make an individual decision because sometimes that individual decision does in fact come back and, and become beneficial for the village. Example again, when I'm sitting with my, with my teenagers who are coming out of the types of environments that many of you have been, have been um, witnessing and bearing in terms of the trauma, they can't see in front of them because everyone is in pain. But when they see me, that's part of them thinking I can move forward. And there is also the space of when the village does its job correctly, it will lift all up. So I am still getting used to being called doctor and I've been a doctor now for 40 plus years. 
It's only when I go home and I realize the pride that's in my community, when they see this black face and they're saying, doctor, when only 4% of all psychologists in America are African-American or black, 4%. So we're a rare breed. And I would imagine each time you climb a ladder, may you be female, what have you, that's symbolic. And that's what I mean by the collective nature. It is not just a group of people who are all saying what you should do in your life. It's the spiritness. It's the collectiveness. If you can feel being loved and lifted by the village, and your village may not be the people you sleep with in the house. The village I'm referring to could in fact be your spiritual um, faith-based group, or it could be the elders, the, 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 the man around the corner, you know, the store shop owner. You know, that village is not limited by biology or or legal alley, and it's not even limited by culture and race because there are many, quote, just to be clear, there's many white folks who vibe better in a collectivist society than they do in an individualistic one. And then there's gonna be some black folks who are more comfortable there. So once again, I say to you, I'm not bringing it either or, I'm bringing it both in. Uh, but the challenge though, is our society tends to dominate in rewarding the individualistic stance. And it inadvertently, or intentionally perpetuates that there's something wrong when you need to, quote, ask for help or you're needing your village or you're trying to move with what's best, making a decision what's best for your family when it's going beyond, as I said, the um, nuclear family, if I borrow that word right now that I don't really like. That gets, that gets looked down upon. When we, when we hear that there's multi-generational families living in a home, the image that comes up, there's something wrong with them, as opposed to understanding that's a strength, that's a value. As a clinical psychologist, we play a role in saying treatment objective, child should individuate and get their own place. That's us imposing a value. Whereas for that cultural group, multi-generational living together is the healthiest way for them to be. It's a both and for me. But to answer your question about how to even speak to your, to your, um, well, <laughs> to speak to the person that you respond to, let me say something about how I conceptualize diversity and inclusion. I think that once again, in our Western way of thinking, which is, tends to be linear, that we missed the boat. We reduced diversity and inclusion to the number of hues around a table, to the number of differentnesses that we can count on a hand. That makes us diverse and inclusive. What I'm purporting to you is it's more about the values. And let me give an example of that. I'm sitting at a dining room table that seats 10. Let you know the, the socioeconomic status I'm living in. Seats 10. I, and I'm seeing these beautiful faces here. I can invite you all over for dinner. And I'm going to make fried chicken because, yes, some stereotypes are true. I like my fried chicken. I'm good at it. And we're going to have collard greens. has a little bit of pork in it. Uh, 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 turkey. Going, turkey. I, I just said a little bit. Well, hold on. Turkey. But it's just it. I'm diverse and inclusive because I'm bringing you all to the table. But at no point did I ask, is anyone a vegetarian? Anyone have any food allergies? Anyone a vegan? Yes, I've been in California to know that one. Right? So, so if I'm really going to be inclusive, before I invite you to my table, I'm going to set it. I'm going to ask you. So for me, that's diversity and inclusion. You have to understand the different values that the people are bringing. Because otherwise, I'm saying, all of you can come here, but you're going to eat like me. Translate, diversity and inclusion has meant in many places, get all the folks around the table, but you're going to work like me, the white heterosexual male dominant thinking person. Sorry, had to name it because that's an ideology. It's a white supremacy ideology. It's a way of thinking and being that all of America's structures were born from. That is the embryonic fluid. And until we intentionally unmask that, we're going to be stuck in, in these various ways of feeling unauthentic and then finding ourselves conflicting around, is it, is it the males having it better than the females, the older folks, the able-bodied folks? That's all the noise. The real issue is that we're working from a white supremacy ideology that doesn't work for anybody, not even for white males. <laughs> so um, some deep. Like I said, uh, all taking us to school, 
I wanted to go to uh, Dr. Arbio also, kind of on this on the same subject as well too. Um, you spent uh, time in a newsroom. Um, you had your trigger point where you were like, "I've got to walk." What does Dr. Arbio? How would I should say? How would Dr. Arbio go back into a newsroom and say, "Hey, this needs to change"? How would you talk to your boss? How would you approach that? How would you suggest that to somebody who is having issues? You know, I, 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 let me give, let me just kind of vibe off what Dr. Jackson was saying a little bit. Um, when we belong to a community, and, and for me, I was saved by the community from the California Chicano News Media Association, where I worked with people from the Black Journalists Association, as well as Latinos. Um, my husband was very involved in, and got me involved. And feeling like I belonged um, is probably what helped me take next steps um, because I had been laid off from two journalism jobs in a year and feeling really crappy about myself and really lost and, and really devalued. Um, so belonging to something bigger than yourself and giving back because we ran a two week long workshop for high school seniors. And when you're giving like that, it brings you back to a place where it's not about you and your ego and your pain. It's about how you can help others. And when we give back, we get so much more in return. So when we're struggling with that, I would really encourage people to look about, look out there and see ways that they can help other people, ways that they can contribute. To your question, how, how would Dr. Arbio go back and, and deal with the newsroom challenges? Um, there is a fantastic book out there called Difficult Conversations. I highly recommend everyone read this book. Um, it really talks about ways to break things down, ways to communicate, ways to improve our conflict management, um, I think we're at a time and a place in journalism where I think we finally got the ears of, of editors and people are starting to reconcile with, oh, well, this one size fits all isn't working. So I think we have the advantage of timing. Um, I would implore newsroom managers in TV, media, online to start looking at their people, not just as commodities, but as individuals who have their own unique, wonderful gifts and talents and reactions and responses and make mental health the conversation, not just, oh yeah, we've got an EAP, go call your therapist, go deal with it. It is part of our problem because we are human beings together in all of this. And journalism is all about connecting. We tell stories all day long and we don't connect in newsrooms. So I would say change the culture to be one of outreach where we have peer support teams of people people can talk to after a tough day at work have meetings where we talk about what's working and what's not working, talking about pay equity, right? Talking about the humaniz humanization of the newsroom and, and seeing how not just the trauma of the job, but the, how the trauma of being in a newsroom impacts every individual. We saw at different newspapers that we lost a lot of talent because people weren't seeing themselves in newsrooms. We had African-Americans and we had Latinos leaving newsrooms at, at pretty nice papers because they didn't feel understood. They didn't feel like they belonged. They didn't feel like their story ideas were being recognized because the white editors didn't think that that was worthy of a story because eh, it doesn't it really set the people. table. It didn't set the table right. <laughs> it resonate, right? And, and so that's, if we do not start looking at people as just that, our biggest asset, black, white, orange, brown, everybody, we all have to start being human instead of being commodities. Um, so that's the other piece of it. And I also would say, my God, you know, value yourself. We are, we are so susceptible to feeling like we're not good enough. Um, start valuing you and what you have to contribute because believe me, it's not about how smart you are, how hard you work or how talented you are. It's about you being your authentic self. And there are a myriad of different studies that tell us in psychology that when we feel comfortable in our own skin, when we embrace our full humanity, we are going to be more authentic, more genuine, more mindful, more generous. We're gonna feel better about ourselves. And when we feel better about ourselves, we are more able to reach out to other people and say, come on along with me. Let's, let's do out, go out and then play. So I think it's hugely yeah. important to, to keep all those pieces in mind. And there's a fourth one too, Tammy, that I wanna add, I, and I love the story you shared about your feeling belonged, right? Because we also would say, again, from Dr. Nobles and, and Kobe Kamban, who's already transitioned, we would say, you need to know who you are and whose you are. Because if you know whose you are, then you're bold enough to step into any space in any way. Because there's an African proverb that says, if you chase a child home, 
and their father answers the door, they no longer fear you. And to be clear, in the African tradition, gender is not dichotomous. It's a mutual complementary piece. But the, but the, the, the fourth one I wanted to add to you is we have to be intentional about our power and privilege. Everyone has power and privilege based on their location. So as a, as a, as a licensed clinical psychologist, training clinicians to become, I'm using my privilege in a very clear way. And when I take a risk and challenge authority, I'm clear about doing that because my counterpart may not be able to do that. To, to be, I, I'm blessed that if, if I were to stop working today, my social economic status would not change. That's a privilege I know that I have, whereas others don't have that. So I'm taking risk from my next generation. And that's where we are right now. Every generation has to do its job in moving the pendulum forward. Our foremothers and fathers saw us free in this moment. That's why they stayed alive, because if any group had a right to take themselves out, it would have been them, but they clearly saw a future. So the question is for us now, regardless of, of, of where you are in this journalistic world, but particularly as black and brown folks, our, the question is, what you going to do? What are you doing today for the next generation behind you? What will the history books say 30, 40 years from now? Have you earned the ancestral right to be an ancestor? And, and, and let's be clear, when I say black and brown, I'm locating the group. It is not an exclusion of anyone else. Don't hear it that way. Let go of the Western ears to hear that. Instead, I'm saying be intentional because that is what we have not been able to do is to be clear about who we are as we're interacting with others. And we must do that. So this is a time to pull your efforts together within your industry and across your industry. Those who are further along, if it's you, Amari, there's a greater weight on your shoulders than it is for that first year intern coming into the field. They can't be the ones to push up against the, the man, if you will. But we have to do it intentionally, not to be looters, but to be clear protesters. So you protest in the street and you protest in the ivory towers. But we must protest for change. Yeah, I think you just touched on that. I don't know if you want to uh, jump in also, Dr. Arbayo. I was just looking over at the, uh, the group chat. And, yeah, uh, I wanted to clarify was... something. Okay. Uh, and it's really important, and I, I appreciate the comment. It is more than feeling misunderstood. People leaving because of systematic and subtle racism and unfair wages and unfair compensation. Absolutely, it is, it is far more, and I'm sorry if I minimize that by any stress, I certainly didn't mean to. Um, when you do not feel like you are being treated fairly, when you know that your colleagues who don't have the same experience or, or the same skin color as you do are being treated differently and you see the favoritism in the newsroom, whether it's about race or gender, um, and you are not getting paid and you are not getting treated and you are not getting that seat at the table, um, it is devastating. And the impact that that has on self-esteem and your ability to do your job, it, it can lead to depression, it can lead to anxiety, it can lead to that just feeling horrible. Um, and there, there's nothing more crushing than looking around and thinking, wow, I, I'm, I'm working around the clock um, trying to do an important job and not feeling appreciated and not feeling respected and not feeling validated. And then when, when you go and you say to your, your bosses, hey, there's something wrong here, and they just kind of pat you on the head and say, well, that's your problem. That's not us. That's about you. It's absolutely devastating. I was going to, so uh, you kind of touched on some of the red flags that happens yeah. when you're dealing with all these uh, various stress, stressors and traumas. Right. Um, but what do, they, what do they actually look like? Um, I just saw the headline. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to read it, but uh, Michelle Obama uh, yeah. Low, low grade depression, if I'm yeah, she's just saying, and that, that's a self diagnosis, right? She's oh. saying I have low grade depression. Yeah. Um, and, and so yeah, tell tell people what is what does it look like when you're when you're going through depression, when sure. uh, you know the mental issues that you suffer dealing with all these things. How do they manifest themselves? What do they actually look like? And I just want to say, Michelle Obama, as if we couldn't love her more, uh, the courage that that takes for her to come out and say, "I'm struggling too. I'm human." I mean as if we needed another reason to love this woman. Oh, thank you, Michelle, for doing that because she gave, gave everyone else permission. Um, and when we see these people that we respect and admire admit to being human, because these things are part of being human, they are responses to the, the ridiculous events that we're going through. They're normal reactions 
to abnormal circumstances. Right. right. So what we're seeing, what, what we see at home, and I want to start with at home because that's where sometimes we just let things go, right? Um, and, and my husband can probably attest to, you know, coming home and all you want to do is focus on the work because when we love doing our jobs, there's an adrenaline that comes with it. I've heard people compare breaking a news story to a great sexual experience because it's that kind of high. And, you know, you go to a great crime scene and you get to hang out with your buddies from different journalistic institutions and we're all a big family and we're all feeling really good about ourselves. And it's easier in, in times and places like that to be at work than it is to be at home where people want you to be loving and understanding and have empathy for their bad day and, and understand what's going on for them and attend to their needs and our kids' needs. Um, so it's, we see it at home usually easier than we see it in the workplace. And at home, we see the irritability. We see the, oh, I don't care, you know, do whatever you wanna do for dinner. I've gotta go up and, and return a few phone calls. And we're constantly on our phones and we're constantly engaged in, in work mode. Instead of giving ourselves the chance to kind of step back, relax and enjoy, the people that we love the most, supposedly, right? Mm -hmm. um, we also dehumanize those people we don't agree with sometimes. We get really angry and we get really frustrated and we start dehumanizing the people that we think are out to do us harm instead of seeing that, you know, all right, I think the guy's a jerk, but, you know, I don't agree with them, but he's not the, the end all, the be all. We also see an increase or a decrease in intimacy. Um, some people withdraw from intimacy when they're struggling and some people just want to have that contact because there is a high that comes with that kind of intimacy. We see an increased use in porn. Um, porn is a natural stimulant, right? It may, we get to orgasm and we feel good. Um, and this generation of, of younger people have more access to and have been more socialized with pornography than any generation before it. Um, and it's, it's really running the gamut of challenges for people. Um, increase in use of food. I mean, I think sugar is the most overused substance in the world. Um, we, we binge eat candy. You know, there are people who have those candy jars at their desk and, and we're all kind of grabbing from it because it's comforting. Um, we drink, God, journalists and alcohol, come on now. You know, it's like peanut butter and chocolate. There's two tastes that go together. I remember sitting in parking lots drinking Miller Genuine Draft with my colleagues at three o'clock in the morning after we finished the night shift, right? And how stupid was that, that we're having a six pack of beer before we get in our cars and drive home, you know? Um, Alcohol is so socially acceptable, right? And if you live in Southern California, even now in a time of COVID, you know, we're out there on the sidewalks in, in 80, 90 degree heat, you know, drinking our rosé and going, mm, feels good, buddies. Um, and then there's tobacco and, and marijuana. Tobacco, people are vaping, they're using the marijuana, they're using illicit drugs. You know, some people abuse other people's Ritalin. I've seen that with a few people because it's a stimulant, it feels good, and it's doing something to escape that feeling. We wanna get away from the sadness, the anxiety, the depression. Um, when, our, when our partners call us out and say, you know, you've changed, something's wrong, right? We really need to hear that. Um, my husband's kind of famous for telling me, hey, you need to step back a little bit because you're being really cranky and like you're getting really annoyed just over like the cat eating food in the bowl, which isn't, come on, back it up. Um, and we need to listen to the people around us. We also need to pay attention to our bodies. When we're not sleeping right, that's usually a pretty good sign. And we're not getting that full six to eight hours sleep we need. We're not getting six to eight hours, folks. We might as well be having shots of tequila for breakfast. That's how impaired we are. Sleep so plays a huge role in regulating mood and regulating our physical functions. When we avoid people we love, when we avoid disconnecting from work, right, we're also saying, hey, I don't want any part of the rest of my humanity, right? We're blocking ourselves off and we're not participating. When we isolate ourselves from everybody and everything, obviously we get lost in our own darkness and those can lead to some pretty deep dark corners. We need to be around people. We need to be enjoying things that have nothing to do with journalism. The journalism is a seductive mistress and she can take over our lives if we let her. It's really easy to get sucked in. So, you know, that's just kind of a, a, a little over and that's a long laundry list i mean just hearing it was making me exhausted i was like okay so what's up on the table <laughs> and you're absolutely right and and when we think about this from an african-centered perspective in terms of values you know linda james myers would talk about an optimal development having a healthy balance that even before you enter and this i think is what some of the comments that are coming up 
on the thread here, which is even before you enter into the field of journalism, there's already a lot of stresses. There's already a disimbalance that one might be in that can lead to symptoms of depression. And there's also other ways in which the symptoms of depression can show up for us, which is internalized racism. When we start um, perpetuating the myth, when we start taking on the, the, the idea of being hyperly sexualized, right? Because that's the story it said about black folks, right? That it's coming out of the internalized racism as well as coming out of internalized racism when we are so critical of others who look like us. We're by, that's another, for me, it's another form of, of depression because it can, it's, it's hurting your spirit and your soul and you're losing your balance. Our optimal way of being as spirit beings is to be in balance with nature and with all of life. And that's why each of that list that Tammy just made can look differently for different folks. It's not the alcohol itself. That's not what I have in here to show you the example. <laughs> I thought I should say that, huh? Are you drinking there? <laughs> <laughs> I should be. So, so it's not the alcohol itself. It's how it's being used in that moment, right? And, and that's what's happening here because we can also have external, externalizing behaviors. You become short-tempered. You, uh, you find yourself shaking your baby and you're a good parent and you find that moment where, where, as that show says, you're snapping. So these two are part of the symptoms of being imbalanced in your psycho-spiritual wellness. So if we start from a place again of how do we create a good circle of care? How do we make sure we have um, spaces and places where it's safe to sort of let down your hair and have courageous healing conversations where it really is okay to talk about not only the, the trauma that Tammy has shared and Omari you've alluded to in this conversation, but even the deeper dive of what it means to be seeing that pain through black and brown eyes. I'm, I'm just staying there because that's the primary identification of the group that invited me here, but it's not exclusive to the group. But what I'm trying to say is we have to be able to talk about that to let it out, which means we also have to be courageous enough to hear each other and suspend judgment and, and, and really say, when you ask someone, how are you doing today? Genuinely have time to hear them and deeply listen, empathically listen, because sometimes just being able to let it out gives me a little bit more breathing space to deal with what I have to deal with one more, one more time. I'm going to close with this. Is Amari C. trying to bring a question in. So Tammy's done a beautiful job of listing everything that we know as psychologists as symptoms of depression. What we haven't done as good of a job with is to learn from those who've been exposed to the same stressors and appear to be successful. How are they doing it? How, and, and, and when we learn more about how they're doing it, how do we make that the standard so that we minimize the potential of the long laundry list of problems? So again, we need it all in here. Know the list, know the signs, but also clearly know what, people, what habits people are starting off with, and particularly now that we're in this COVID state of mind, where as you know better than anybody, you can be on the Zoom forever. And it's not healthy. So no one's talking about, okay, if we're going to be on Zoom, let's have some agreement about the amount of hours, the start time. What does it mean to be balancing my job with caring for my loved one? May it be my mother, my children, what have you. You know, we can't keep on being the heroes and sheroes that American society has set us up to be. We have to humble ourselves and say, I can't get through this without you. So how do I create a circle of care with my people? While I'm meeting with my boss, maybe my child is having a Zoom lesson with their uncle who's in another state who's doing a history lesson with them versus me thinking I have to do all of the teaching. Just throwing all those ideas in there as well too. we think about the impact. Okay, yeah, I wanted to start to, uh, trying to bring in some questions here, but I also wanted you guys, we've been talking about some of the issues. I wanted to talk about some solutions as well. But I just saw um, Jerry brought up a good question about being able to separate work me from personal me. Uh, how do you go about doing something like that? And, and I think this goes to what Dr. Jackson was saying. We have to do a better job of creating boundaries and empowering ourselves to create those boundaries because the work demands 
if we worked as much as work would like us to work, we'd be working 24 seven, right? If we were spending time with our family as much as our family wants to do, we'd be spending time with them 24 seven, intending to this. And there's, there's plenty of things to keep us busy. And I think in the society in general, um, and I work with first responders and emergency responders too, and I see this with them as well. It's, we're all struggling to, how do I take care of me? And how do I identify myself in the world other than just my occupation? And how do I value myself as a whole human being, flaws and all, in addition to being a badass journalist. Um, and, I, and I think that is, there, there's some internal work that we need to do, but we also have to recognize we have been socialized in a lot of different regards to say your value is based on what your employer tells you your value is, what your paycheck is, and how happy you make the people in your life. And I think there's some fundamental flaws in that because if we don't value ourselves fundamentally, then we are at the whim, whim of everyone else's whims. Right. And, and so part of it, a huge part of this is self-love and self-esteem, right? And of course, mm -hmm. I'm a shrink, we're going to talk about self-esteem, mm -hmm. right? Valuing yourself just because you're alive and breathing on the planet means you have value. Everything else builds on that. And so if we go back to this idea that because I am alive and I am created, I am valuable and I'm lovable. And I don't have to do much else in order to have that. I just have to breathe and be on the planet. Right. And so for those who are interested in the world, at, make sure that we look at how our workplace makes us feel and how the people in our lives make us feel and how we respond to that instead of setting firm in the i'm a good person i'm worthy of love and respect we don't let other people mess with that right we hold firm into that that way when the winds of change come and their stuff becomes their stuff and they come to us and say well you didn't work hard enough or oh you know you should have done a better job or oh you got scooped by dana littlefield which by the way happened a few times um <laughs> instead of letting that take a toll on your self-esteem, you take it for what it is and you don't personalize it. And what else oh, like too is if, if you subscribe to a cultural way of being too, then it's also the use of rituals, right? How do you set up a ritual for how your day starts? May that be, for me, as someone who's always sitting in trauma and working with those who are experiencing trauma and how do I take care of myself as I'm opening myself up to hold each of these stories is through a ritual like libation. So I'm very clear about how I start my sessions. Now my clients don't need to know. And these, these aren't drinks again, right? We, it's okay, not drinks. We did that. Yes, we did. Yeah, you got, you, you got to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> so with what we're learning in African tradition is that we are spirit beings having a human experience and our spirits are all connected. And many times they're, they're, they're meeting each other before our physical bodies do. And, I, and again, uh, as I said to Mari before, we could do a, a, um, a survey here about how many of us have, have heard this concept of that baby's been here before, or, 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 we, or, or there's something about the spiritness of that child that makes you feel like this is deep, even though the baby hasn't said a word yet, you can kind of sense that there's a strong spirit there. Or you may know that you may have met someone and, and, and before you really knew who they were, something came over you and said that we've been together before and it didn't feel safe, right? So these are those spirit things. So, so when we think about libations, what we, what we believe is that when we, we have multiple lives, when we move through this life, we become into the spirit world, one with the divine, you know, the creator, so that our ancestors are doing the work for us as well. We, we're here because the ancestors told us we'd be here in this moment. So we do libations where we're calling on the names of those spirits who we want to be in the day with us. May it be my own and my own personal family, like my, like my grandmother, or it could be um, significant figures like our dear John Lewis has now entered into the ancestral realm. And so, but we still call upon his spirit, call upon his image, call upon his name as I'm looking to make sure I get into good trouble. Okay, in, in his name. So that's one way. You can also have rituals where some of us, we even have altars set up in our, in our safe space, in our homes where in an altar is gonna have images from life forces, the, a plant that's growing because of the importance of the life force that's there, the use of water. It may have pictures or figurines of those who've passed by, passed on, who, who've transitioned. That's part of a ritual as well too, that helps you remind you again, who you are and whose you are. That when it's hard for me to get up and get going, I might not be able to do it for me, but I, write me, but I might remember my grandmother and get up for her until I'm able to keep getting up for myself. 
Those are clear. And then of course, as I said too, it's having a good circle of friends. I'll be very clear. I'm trained as a psychologist. I love the people, but sometimes I work with folks that just drive me crazy. And so I have to have a good set of colleagues where I can say, oh, I have to tell you this session I just had. And sometimes I'm clear, I have sessions that I wanna take a shower, right? Because it's just, I just got oozed all over, right? But, but I know that my heart's in the right place and I'm still human. So having my close circle of sister friends in the service of psychology, I can let my hair down and they're not gonna judge me again. It, it's part of the stress release and leave it there so I can open myself back up to the love that I need for my clients. So there should be rituals. And, and I know when I went back to school, my children were young, I made sure my sister friends were around me because I knew I did not want it to be at the cost of my kids. And I might be the last one to see that. But my sister friend would see something yoke me back in and say, excuse me, this is what's happening. So, so again, what Tammy is saying and what I'm adding here deeply is be intentional. Be intentional to ask yourself, what do I need? What helps me? Not more than just what makes me feel good, but what genuinely helps me? What feeds my mind, body, and spirit? For some, it might be, you know what? I really have not paid attention to my cultural ethnic background. Let me just do some readings around that and see what resonates with me, what really makes sense that's still, that's still part of me. That could be part of your self-care. As you're using the words compartmentalizing, or I might again invite you, bless your heart, to, to think of it about how do I do what I need to do in this moment and then care for myself the way I need to care for myself in the next moment. So they're connected, right? Because if you stay focused on how do I compartmentalize, you're not asking yourself, well, once I compartmentalize, what do I do with that afterwards? Because you'll end up compartmentalized, compartmentalized, and then you're gonna boil over. And that's when it leads to the beautiful laundry, ugly list that Tammy shared, but she did it eloquently. So I'm just saying, you have to do both. How do you put on your armor and how do you know when it's time to take it off and make sure you do that? and replenish yourself. That could be a spiritual practice. It could be your religious faith-based space. It could, in fact, be with your children. Healthy depression. I mean, healthy distraction, I'm trying to say. Because I can remember when I was working, I had this long commute, and I would use that as a way to literally leave the fight I just had at home with my children. God bless my beautiful husband, who I think is the other perfect man in the world. So, Tammy, we have one of each. Okay. We got the two, Dr. Jackson. Exactly. You and me. We and got smart. more importantly, once I saw the pain and how people were, were burning children's bodies, because it's part of my forensic assessment, you know, is seeing what happens to kids who've had, um, I, I don't want to name it all because naming it all to me gives it more power as well. We don't need to name the pain. You've all seen it. But my point being, I also had to have a ritual of self-care for my spirit that when I left work, I could come home. And be, and, be, and be fully present there and not feel guilty that I was coming home to a safe place, but instead to know that because I'm able to live a safe life, it lets my, my family, my village members who are sitting in pain know that they too can have a safe life because what ends up happening is when you're exposed to so much pain, that's all you see and you don't see your future. So you, you don't see yourself in this professionalism. So celebrate the successes that you've made, resist the temptation, the human temptation to feel guilty about it, particularly if you're like me, one of the first blacks in your generation, because I still have folks living paycheck to paycheck. This COVID is putting them back out in the streets. I mean, this is my immediate extended family. So I'm living a very different life. So we have to make peace with that and not feel guilty by it, not, and at the same time, do what we can for others, but do take care of ourselves. And so I'll just close by saying rituals, establishing rituals, establishing a, a circle of care, knowing when and how to take off the coat, and grace and forgiveness. Grace and forgiveness. Grace and forgiveness for yourself. Some wise words right there. And um, for those who hadn't seen uh, Dr. <laughs> um, she was addressing uh, Vanessa's question with regards to uh, oppression takes it, taking its toll on you and uh, how do you compartmentalize. 
um, Dr. Arbayo, I was going to um, pose that question to you as well, too. Okay. Um, how would you address that? I think that having a way of dumping this stuff out after a day where you are bearing witness to all that suffering um, could not be more valuable. So have a coming home ritual where you have a transition between work and home where you can dump the crap out, the ugly, oozy, icky, gooky things. Um, whether that's putting the, putting the windows down and driving with the disco music up on 10, whether you're calling your, your friends and saying, I just had the shittiest day imaginable, I need to vent. Whether it's you doing some, some meditation or some deep breathing or, you know, I used to do this crazy thing, and I still do it, where I put the top down on my convertible and as I top, put the top down, I would imagine the hooks of the day, the ugly incidents and the ugly people, and I would imagine the hooks just kind of flying off into the air and bursting into uh, fireworks, right? And to me, that was a way of, of letting go. But then I would get home and it would be, hey, how was your day at work? And some of that stuff would come back. And I would go out into the backyard and go into the garden and water some trees and just say, I'm taking some me time just to let some of this out and reconnect with the rest of my life. Because in my backyard, in the house that I share with my husband and my family, that is where I am the best of me. And I look around and I say, this is all of our hard work paying off. This is why I've done what I've done to make a living. This is where I want to be. And it's, it's grounded. Being in nature, taking a deep breath, getting some water on your shoes, right? Having, and that's me, that's what works for me. But spend some time developing that kind of decompression transition. That way, when you walk in the door, you don't have the horrors of the day stuck right here and ready to just vomit on your significant other, your kids. And I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And you can also love yourself through the process of tapping into your creativity. I know, again, for me, sometimes I've actually written letters to, um, I still feel, I've written letters to those whose pain I've witnessed. It has been hard to hold on to. And I honor it by writing that letter, even if I never send it. So I journal that. I do what I'm doing now. I allow myself to have a cry. Sometimes I'll say, I'm going into my pity party, see, in two days. <laughs> I'm real clear about that. I put my head down and ostrich it. So I'm, I'm saying that's going to be grace and kindness. You have to be creative. You have to find a way to feed your spirit, your soul, your essence, your being, to remember your humanity. It could be something too as simple as when you look in the mirror, just love yourself looking deeply into that mirror and pray for those, whatever your, whatever your spiritual practice might be, how do you lift up in your mind, in your heart, those who are still sitting in pain so that you can send them some spiritual strength to get through what they need to get through. So, so again, I love everything that, that Dr. Tamia said and as you might hear, I'm stretching it to more of a collective because that is also what gets us through. Somebody prayed me into this space. Somebody lifted me up to be okay. I did not do it by myself. So for those that that resonates with, that is your other energy, your other space as well too. I don't know, uh, for some reason, this is kind of crazy, but for some reason what resonated with me um, is you said that you, uh, you go into your pity party and you cry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some good things um, were said with regards to feeding your spirit, feeding your soul, um, positive energy. But how important is it to release, to cry, maybe to scream? Um, is that something that's really important to do? Because we are taking in so much. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how, do you, yeah how do you release and yes. how, do you get, how do you get it out? How do you cleanse? You, you cry essential. when you need to cry, right? I mean, for me, I would go into the, the this is a little embarrassing to admit, um, I would go into the laundry room, close the door and put the washing machine on and just let it out and just have like that ugly cry. You ladies know what I'm talking about. You just let the stuff out. Um, Journaling is another great way, but you sweat, right? Go to the gym and work it out, run it out, let it out of your body, let it let go. Because catharsis, whether it's writing or screaming, letting it out frees you from it. You cannot hold this stuff in because when we do, it destroys us internally and it eventually comes out and usually comes out in some destructive ways. I like to liken it to lava, right? You've got, you've got to care enough about yourself to say, I don't want this ugly contaminant sitting inside of me so that all it's going to do is do damage to me and the people that I love and the place and the space that I want to be in, 
right? Gratitude lists are a fantastic way of kind of releasing some of that because when we focus on the things that we're grateful for, we let go of some of the other stuff as well, right? The, the Dalai Lama had, had some really great points about gratitude and about mindfulness. Um, and for those of us who might not be very spiritual, but, but like the idea of just being focused and present on the moment, you know, meditation. Meditation, I think Billy Joel said, we all have cathedrals of our own, right? Find your own cathedral, whether it is a religious cathedral, whether it is in nature, whether it's just dumping with your friends and, and kvetching over coffee. Um, uh, yeah. that space for yourself it is just hugely important I'm sorry Dr. Jackson no you're fine Tammy it, it's hard because like, I think I was like one delay behind you so my apologies to you I didn't mean to talk over you I, I would expand the list again because I'm always going to do that that's my job right is expand the list to think of a couple of, first of all we have to honor every single feeling we have and this is very clear is that there's a lot of social messaging again for black and brown folks to not be angry because someone else gets afraid of our anger, right? To, to not show pain. Again, the myth of the strong black woman, it's all we're supposed to do, do, do for everybody but ourselves, right? And as I said, the John Henryism of men, this idea that you're supposed to be strong to take on anything and not worry about. We have to really be clear about, I am angry, I am hurt, this, this does make me crazy. How do you let all of that out? And sometimes, we, in terms of emotional intelligence, sometimes we don't even recognize what we feel and we have to learn to do that. Some of us are socialized to have more in, emotional intelligence to name that. When you, you, some of us may come out of cultural groups and practices and spaces where you don't do that. So this has to be intentional. And I will also say, even though I concur about this idea of when we come home, how do we not quote, bring it home and yet, we are bringing it home. We can't help but bring it home because we're all connected. So once again, I might say, how do you have real conversations with your loved ones about how you're going to hold this? Because sometimes when we are trying to take care of ourselves to not hurt them, sometimes they feel left out. So each, each family has to figure out what the vibe is for them. Tammy and I just offering a, a slew of menu of things, but the, uh, the objective here is to really invite you to be curious about what works for you and yours. Because in some spaces, like my, sons, my son would ask me, mom, how was your day? And I say it was fine. And he's 15. He said, no, mom, really, how was your day? They know where I work. They know what I do. And he wanted to hear what I was dealing with. Now, of course, I didn't give it all to him, but I was but I, I appreciated him for teaching me that he needed to know what I was really going through so he could bear witness to that in support of me. And, that, and that's, he's a beautiful young man now. So my point I'm trying to say here is, yes, do all of that for your own self-care. But again, when you understand who's in your circle of care, how do you have critical conversations with, baby, how are we going to handle this? Because I got a high stress job, you got a high stress job. How are we going to hold each other's stress and be there for each other? And then you, and then you come up with your own create creativity around that. It might be okay. You've got twenty minutes to tell me everything that happened, and I'm not going to ask you anything, and we'll move on. Or it could be that they say, "I do want to hear and talk with you about it and be part of the solution." And I also want to say too, it is important for us to learn how to name our real feelings in front of our next generation because that's how they will learn to do it. Otherwise, they will end up protecting you the way you protect them. Here's your pediatric psychologist telling you that. I can't tell you how many times parents would say, I have a great relationship with my child. Our children want to protect us the way we protect them. So if you're withholding information from them for their good, I guarantee you they're withholding it from you too for your good. <laughs> So again, I'm not saying sit somebody right down, talk to me and tell me everything. No, I'm saying you first have to model it, make sure you're in a good space and say, you know, baby, I just realized I know I got a lot going on. I, I was, I just want to check and see how is this affecting you? And I just really want to listen. And, and that's important. And I'll tell my little story. When my daughter was off to college and she was a great teacher, she would say, mom, just listen. Because of course I'd want to go into solution mode. So when I talk to her, I'm like this, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> yes, baby, because I really had to resist my mother bear temptation to solve it for her and give her what she needs, which is simply genuine listening. So I offer that too, because some of you may be in circles of care 
that that's what they want to, is just to really listen to your story, or they may want you to listen to theirs. That's, a, that's profound right there, because that's something that I heard from uh, an ex way, way back, that uh, you don't want to hear solutions all the time. Sometimes you just want to hear for somebody to listen. So yeah, yeah. a great conversation. I'm trying to see anybody out there who has uh, any more questions before we start to wrap up. Uh, this has been uh, recorded, so if you happen to miss a portion of it, you can go to nabj.org uh, and check it out there. Um, and if nobody else has any other questions, any other closing thoughts that you guys would like to uh, share with the folks out there? Yeah, I would say, you know, if you're struggling, get help. Find a doctor who works for you. If you have a session where you don't feel like there's a love connection between the therapist, fire the therapist. Go find somebody else. Um, it's almost like dating sometimes. You can go through several doctors and not feel like they get you, they vibe with you. That relationship's huge. Um, make sure that you find someone who gets you. Find someone who understands the journalism and the demands of somebody who understands your culture, your perspective, who gets you, right? That, there's nothing more important. Don't hesitate to reach out for help and let's support each other as we're all struggling. Peer support isn't just some organized sense. It's just being there and being socially around and, and noticing, hey, someone's having a rough time let me do what I can do to reach out to them. Okay. Um, addition, oh, go, ahead. Go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, in addition to that, I would say be intentional about developing your circle of care while you are in your best space. Don't wait until you need the help to create the help. Trust yourself. Also, I extend an invitation to you. You're welcome to be part of the Association of Black Psychologists. We are not you do not have to be a psychologist to be there. You just have to be clear about wanting to center your work around black psychology. What does it mean to be healthy and whole from a culturally centered place? And I would also say too, please Zola up, love yourself. And Zola is a, is a, a Kakanga term that means an activating action oriented protective love. And if you create that Zola up on one another, it will get you through today and tomorrow in the future. And I just want to say, Asante Sana, thank you for having me here. Great, great, great. And uh, you all were talking about creating your communities. Uh, we got some folks out there uh, who are trying to create their community as well and asking uh, if you guys are active on social and what your handles oh, yeah. may be. I'm on Facebook, Tammy McCoy Arbio. Um, Spell Arbio for us. A-R-B-O. A-L-L-O, -L -L just like it sounds, A-R-B-A-L-L-O. -L -L -L. Uh, if you're friends with Dana Littlefield or Jerry McCormick, they're friends with me on Facebook. Um, I'm also on, on Twitter. Um, crap, I can't remember my handle. I think it's, if you just Google Dr. Tammy McCoy, it should come up. Um, or you can reach out to anybody through NABJ, Donna, Jerry, know how to get a hold of me. Dana knows how to get a hold of me. Um, Omari knows how to get a hold of me. Please don't hesitate, reach out if, if I can provide any insight or any help or you're looking for someone to help you out, I can provide, provide you with resources. So just pick up the phone or text or email. Touche to you, Dr. Tammy, for, for navigating that social media. I'm still <laughs> in that digital divide. It scares me. I have those things, but I'm not on them. Instead, what I would invite folks to do is to visit um, the, the Association of Black Psychologists Facebook. One of the things that we've been doing in response to the COVID and the 1619 pandemic is that we've been hosting a series of talks that are really to be what we're doing now. Like we did something around how do you deal with the grief and loss of a loved one during the midst of the pandemic grounded in our cultural way of being. So we've recorded all of those talks. They're on our YouTube. I invite you to listen to those at any time, see what resonates with you and stay in conversation with us. So again, it's the Association of Black Psychologists. There's a Facebook page and there's a YouTube page, and I'm sure you'll be able to find it before I can name it correctly for you. <laughs> All right, cool. And I like, uh, I like, I like Dr. Uh, Arbio's handle, Real, Real McCoy. Nice, Real McCoy. nice touch. That's, that's, that, that's that journalism, it. that writer in you. Yes. You, gotta, you gotta you gotta embrace it so thank you ladies so very much really appreciate it some great thank words you. great wisdom uh, things that uh, feed you. our soul as well too so yeah thank you to all your journalists out there doing a great job i mean go out there kick butt we're, we're counting on you all right peace and blessings i'm counting on you to change the system too so it becomes more humane so i'm looking for that okay when i come back in another year i want to hear what what changes you've been able to make within 
the culture of the industry because that's what we really, what we really need too. As I bear witness to the stories that you've all, that's been shared here today, clearly your system is not working for most people and definitely not for many. All right, time to take action, NABJ. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good one. Uh, once, once again, nabj.org to check out uh, anything you may have missed.